So thank you very much to the organizer for my, the invitation. Uh, I will talk about the advances in Kreutzer-Jakob disease diagnosis. Uh, and uh, I will give you first uh, an overview about Kreutzer-Jakob disease because we spoke about uh, Alzheimer and front temporal. So I give you, first of all, an overview about prion disorders. So prion disorders, you see, are neurodegenerative disorders and uh, rapidly progressive and are characterized neuropathologically by the presence of spongiosis in the white matter and uh, in the absence of uh, inflammatory cells, and they are transmissible. So this is the, an example of the MRI of a patient with Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. You see the hyperintense signal in the cortical ribbon, which uh, reflect uh, the spongiosis that we see in the pathology. Here we have the comparison with a normal brain. You see the difference. And uh, another aspect that we have here is the presence of gliosis, which is the reactive gliosis that we see in uh, human prion disorders. So the etiology of this uh, human prion disease uh, belongs genetic, sporadic, and acquired. And the genetic form uh, covers more than 90% of cases. And 10% uh, are genetic, and the other one are acquired. And you remember very well the uh, uh, the iatrogenic form and uh, the form BSC related, like variant CJD. Uh, the genetic form are related to mutation in the PRP gene, and you see here the different disease phenotype, which are related to specific mutation. Uh, the mechanism is based on a change in the conformation from a normal form of PRP, you see that is principally conformed as alpha helix, into a beta sheet form. And uh, the presence of the normal prion proteins is fundamental to have the transmission. That means that if you don't have the substrate for conversion, you don't have propagation. So all the different forms, which are based on different etiology, recapitulate uh, in the formation of a pathological form. Of course, in the sporadic form, we don't know the mechanism which lead to the formation of the first molecule of the PRPSC. In the mutated cases, we have a predisposition due to the genetic to the formation of the PRPSC. And here in the fashion form, we have the direct exposure to a PRPSC molecule. So the combination between one molecule of aberrant conformation of PRPSC with the normal form of PRP, you see that uh, there is a change in the conformation and then uh, the formation of uh, seed, of oligomer, of uh, pathological prion protein. So Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease is the most common form. This is the, uh, I had this slide from the re registry of uh, uh, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. You see that uh, the incidence in Italy is 2.2 per million of people. And uh, you see here the distribution with age uh, that uh, the uh, high is between 65 and 70. Uh, the characteristic of this disorder is uh, a rapidly progressive disorder, 24 months, usually uh, is the longest duration, and it is clinically characterized by different uh, uh, disease, clinical onset, which is dementia, visual disturbance, in cerebella. It's, I mean, uh, it might be variable in, uh, in terms of, uh, of clinical onset. And then we have some diagnostic test which might help in the diagnosis, uh, in particular, the EEG, we show the periodic sharp waves complex, uh, the positivity of 1433 protein, and uh, the positivity at MRI in the cortical, cortical ribbon or in the basal ganglia. However, the definite diagnosis is based on neuropathology still. Uh, in the past, 1959, Alema and Bignami were the first to make a grouping of different uh, clinical variants of uh, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. They divide it in classic, which is characterized by cognitive impairment attacks and myoclonal hallucination, uh, the one, the attacks you form, the cognitive form, the affective, and uh, the amyotrophic. So if we see at the neuropathology, the neuropathology of CJD, you see that uh, there are different patterns of spongiosis as well as different pattern of PRP deposition. So this is something that uh, we know from a long time. And uh, even the MRI might be variable 
in, uh, in CJD. You see we have forms which have an upper intense signal in the thalamus, other forms which are mainly concentrated in the basal ganglia, other which are basal ganglia, thalamus and cortical ribbon, and other forms mainly concentrated in uh, the cortical ribbon. So the point is that uh, there is a, an influence uh, in this sporadic form on the codon 129 in terms of disease uh, susceptibility to Kreutzfeldt-Jakob as, well, as well as a uh, disease modifier. You see that uh, here in the normal population, uh, the 50% are homozygous methionine, while in the sporadic CJD, 90% are homozygous. So it indicates that we have, there is a predisposition in the homozygous as well as a different disease phenotype. Another influence of the result of the uh, disease phenotype is the presence of protease resistant PRP. You see here the two types that has been described by Gambetti in 1996. Uh, you see here the cold type 1 and uh, the type 2 based uh, on the different migration in, uh, in the gel. And uh, the different migration is based on a different cleavage of protease digestion and, te and terminus. You see here that uh, if it is more end terminus, we have a, a more slowly <coughs> migrating protein, whereas it is more to the C terminus, we have the type 2 and more to the C terminus. And this means that the different cleaver size is related to different conformation of the PRPSC, as we call it commonly as strain. So the combination between the codon 129 and the type of uh, PRPSC correlate to six different uh, uh, CJD subtypes uh, characterized by distinct uh, uh, clinical and pathological phenotype. And here I, I will give you a brief uh, representation of, uh, this is the old clinical definition of clinical variant, it is the molecular subtype, here the disease duration and the, the clinical phenotype. In other words, uh, there is a, a kind of grouping based on the molecular feature of all this form. Of course, you see here that most of the sporadic form are the one with uh, myoclonic and idenum, which cover around 70% of all cases, and the ataxic form will cover almost 25%. So most of the cases are grouping in these forms. And uh, here you have less common form, which are, I mean, uh, very, very rare. So, variant crossfield jacob disease is almost a finished disorder. I mean, uh, following the uh, BSC uh, uh, epidemics, uh, uh, there are no cases. You see here the last cases that has been observed in uh, UK, 178. Uh, we had three cases in, in Italy and uh, four cases in the United States. You see here the distribution that uh, is related to the BSC exposure. And uh, in this case, we have a clear example of uh, how the codon 129 predisposed to BSC infection. Since 99% of cases are homozygous methionine, while I will show you, uh, as been reported, one case is heterozygous at codon 129. So this is a typical case of variant CJD MM. At condom 129, this is the age of 29 years old, this is duration 40 months, psychiatric symptom, painful sensory symptoms, cerebellar ataxia, and uh, a dementia in the late course. And uh, however, you see in the MRI the typical positivity in the pulvina, which is a specific sign of variant CJD. An important thing is that different from the sporadic form, the BSC strain in human colonized the uh, lymphoreticular system, such as uh, in vitam, you can do a tonsil, tonsil biopsy and detect directly, you see, uh, the presence of, uh, of prion. And uh, post-mortem, uh, there is uh, the typical signature of BSC that compared to the sporadic form, it is characterized by a higher representation of the higher band, which is the glycosylated. And from neuropathology, from neuropathology, you see the typical florid plaques, uh, which are never observed in uh, sporadic form. 
So recently, in 2017, has been published this case that was heterozygous as CODON 129. It was a man 36 years old, disease duration 15. And you see here, the clinical disease is not very distinguishable from MV2 uh, uh, sporadic. And in particular, the it was AEG was not specific, but in particular, you see that the distribution of the lesion at MRI overlap to the one that we observe in the sporadic form. So it was quite perplexing. And the RT-quick was negative. This is the neuropathological study. We show clearly the presence of the typical lesion that we observe in variant CJD. And here, the patient uh, that had the glycoform pattern of uh, variant CJD, which is different from the one with the observing sporadic. So the problem is uh, searching from an in vivo prion test. That is, you, you remember when there has been the BSC epidemic, the one who can get an, a blood test in the, the catheter being millionaire. So it's been for several years an issue to be, to be pursued. Uh, so there are these oligomerocytic assay, uh, which has characterized on a mechanism on conversion of prion conversion or replication. The oligomers act as template of uh, homologous protein structure. In CJD, they are highly specific and sensitive. The limit of detection is in the order of femto up to molar, so 10 minus 11. And uh, the efficiency in replication is dependent from the conformation of the PRP and might be also be suitable for large scale testing. So the two major testing that are used in the clinical setting is uh, PMCA and RT-Quick. Uh, I give you an example. This is the sample that we want to test. The PMCA use brain homogenate to amplify the oligomers that we have in our sample. And the, the, the brain homogen should be should be homologous to the oligomer that we want to amplify. That means that we want to amplify a human oligomer. We have to use transgenic mice with humanized PRP, so with the same sequence. And following a cycle of sonication, you see that uh, all the normal PRP, which is in the tube, is converted to the uh, aberrant form. And then this sample is digested with proteinase K, and we visualize the pathological PRP using a Western blot. Differently, the RT-Quick use a di completely different method because uh, uh, there are uh, wells uh, which contain recombinant prion proteins, so it does not come from the brain, but it is a recombinant one, uh, and uh, a dye which is thioflavin. So when we put in our well uh, the recombinant protein, the thioflamine, and the oligomers, when the, the substrate of the prion protein changes the conformation into the oligomer, you see there is a kind of fluorescence that it is emitted by uh, the converted protein which has linked the thioflamine. And you see here that we have the curve of fluorescence. So the limit of detection of this method is 10 minus 9, 10 minus 8, 10 brain dilution, so it is consistently sensitive and 100% specific. So these are pros and cons of PMCA. PMCA is, uh, of course, highly sensitive and specific, like it is RT-Quick. However, one point is to have a provision of uh, fresh tissue to amplify the PRPSC, while uh, in the RT quick, you need, you need simply a recombinant protein that uh, you can make in your lab. Uh, is low efficiency, the PMCA from CJD, while uh, uh, RT quick is low efficient for variant CJD, but you understand that uh, the variant CJD is almost, uh, uh, there is no more cases. So, I mean, uh, RT quick is much more useful in this context. So, uh, PMCA is a little longer. Uh, RT-Quick is very rapid. Now with the new method of the CSF, we have a, a test which uh, in 20 hours we have already the result. Uh, it is, PMCA is really clinically demanding. So not many laboratories are able to set up the PMCA while the RT-Quick has been set in several laboratories in Europe. There are even uh, a couple of studies of uh, the, which uh, include uh, all the European group that uh, 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 use the RT-Quick in the laboratory, and most of the data 
uh, overlap. The other prime problem is that with PNCA you generate infectious prions. So the safety of the lab would be uh, very, very restricted uh, while the product of generation of the ArtiQuick are so far not infectious. Uh, PMCA, this is the study that uh, Tagliavini did with Claudio Sotto in variant CJD, and they show the positivity in the urine. They take a sample of urine, uh, they centrifuge the urine, they take the supernatan, ultra centrifugation, they detect the debris of urine, they wash the debris and uh, take the supernatan after ultra centrifugation, and they mix the two products uh, using uh, transgenic mice brain homogenate. And you see here that following uh, different cycles of, uh, of uh, oh, excuse me, different cycles of PMCA, you see that here uh, they observe positivity in the urine. And this is from the debris and the supernatal. However, they obtain a specificity, of course, of 100%, and they have a sensitivity of uh, 97, I mean 13 out of 14. But the negative patient was a patient that was treated with pentosan polysulfate for more than 100 months. So probably it was an effect of the therapy. Uh, this test has been largely used even in the blood sample. You see this study has been done by the French group. They show a high sensitivity and specificity. They use a different method for concentration PRPSC from uh, plasma using uh, uh, um, uh, magnet beads. Uh, which bind with plasminogen, which bind PRPSC, and then they amplify the samples using uh, PMCA. However, what it is interesting in this study that they have even the blood from presymptomatic patients. And you see here that before the clinical onset, uh, you see 31, 19, and seven months before the clinical onset, the blood was positive. And this is another example of another patient where you see 16 months before the disease onset there was positivity at PMCA in the plasma. And this is not surprising because, as you recall, long time ago has been published a case of a patient with variant CJD that had an appendicectomy three years before, and they look at the append appendicectomy and in the appendix where the PRP has seen the positive. So, I mean, in some way replicate uh, uh, what has been already done, I mean, at least three years before there is a uh, replication of prions in the lymphoreticular tissue. This is another example of PMCA. As I told you, uh, there, is, there might be uh, infectivity uh, uh, due to the procedure. And you see that uh, even if you go forever for using this cycle of PMCA using a substrate of Benvol, you are able to generate prion de novo. And in particular, if uh, the environment is prion contaminated, you see here the negative control after four cycles, they become positive. So it is a little risky. Uh, ArtiQuick is uh, the method that I show you. Uh, the first description in human uh, uh, diagnostic was in the CSF 2011. The paper was by Atarashi. And uh, uh, subsequently, in 2012, the first large multicentric study, you see that in this study they tested 123 CSF with uh, a specificity of almost 100% and uh, a sensitivity of around 90%. So there is no discrimination among uh, the different codon 129 in uh, uh, sporadic forms. So this is the curve. You see here the brain homogenate, and here you have the result uh, of the CSF amplification. Uh, subsequently, in 2014, uh, another study, by changing the condition, I mean by increasing the temperature and uh, changing the substrate, because uh, the substrate commonly used was a full-length Amster PRP, by using a truncated form of 90 to 231, there was a clear increase of sensitivity to 94% and a reduction consistently of the time of, uh, of, uh, of results. You see here, using the old system and the new system, you see after 20 hours, uh, there is already the result. So we 
were keen of olfactory system. We have an, an ancient antecedent story. Uh, we published this paper in 2003, where we show the presence of PRPSC in the olfactory neurons in, in the cadaver. Uh, this is the immune electron microscopy of the cilia of the neurons of the epithelium. You see here the gold particles which are deposited at the level of cilia. So I show you what we decide to do. We decide to do a kind of uh, uh, brushing of, uh, of uh, this tissue in patients with CJD. And uh, of course, this is an example. The patient arrived, signed the informed consent. Of course, if it is a CJD, he will not sign, but uh, uh, the relative. And uh, we prepare uh, the patient. Uh, we put the mask uh, on mouth. And then the otolaryngologist uh, do an inspection of the nasal cavity to see whether there is a septum deviatum, polyposy, whatever, I mean, otolaryngology condition which might influence. So we cover the fiberscope using uh, a shield to have not uh, a potential contamination of the instrument, but the instrument is posed on the lower part of the nose just to visualize the nasal cavity. Uh, you see here in uh, the, the otolaryngologist see the movie and uh, now take this schwab. You see that it's a simple cotton schwab and it is inserted in the nasal cavity and uh, it is absolutely painful. Huh? This is the nasal septum. <laughs> this is the medial, Fabrizio knows very well. So this is the medial turbinate, okay? And the cotton schwab is inserted between the septum and the medial turbinate, so you reach the olfactory part. So, and uh, you simply give just a rolling uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the schwab, and you collect such as one million of cells, which are 300,000 and most uh, olfactory neurons. So uh, the sample is in put in saline, and then it tests to the lab. So this is uh, what we collect by a, a sampling sampling, uh, these are mature olfactory neurons because they are olfactory marker and protein positive. So based on this assumption, we study 31 subjects where we compare the diagnostic sensitivity and specificity of nasal brushing versus CSF. And uh, surprisingly, you see here the 14 patient, the blue line is olfactory mucosa while the red line is the CSF. And you see that in the olfactory mucosa, we have a consistently higher seeding activity compared to the CSF. And uh, in some patients, we have a negative CSF and a positive signal in the uh, olfactory mucosa. So at the end of the study, you see over 31 subject study, we have 30 positive, one negative, while in the CSF, we have 23 out of 30, which is a completely different sensitivity with 100% specificity. So we go to a second study because at the beginning in the study that I show you in the New England Journal, we use a brushing, not a schwab. So to have a lesser harmful procedure, we switch from a brush to, from a brush to a schwab. Okay, to have, a, I mean, to have not blood contamination, whatever, because this is a little more traumatic compared to the Schwab, so we decided to change. But the problem was if we change the tool, probably we have a change in the result, but this was not. So uh, we used uh, the Schwab versus brush, and uh, we send an envelope to the different neurology con containing the shield for the fiberscope, four tubes, and four Schwab. And I called them to see the movie that uh, you have seen in YouTube, and then, I mean, I have not to go, not to do anything because they were simply instructed by using, uh, by see, looking at the movie. So the point is that uh, these are 87 patients in the, uh, in the CSF. We have uh, in the uh, one that we definite case 18 out of 20 positive, while all were in the olfactory mucosa were positive. This is another example that we have all the patient positive in the CSF, but one negative in the OM. And this is the cases with the possible CJD uh, with the 
8 out of 9 in the CSF, in the definite, 9 out of 9 in the olfactory mucosa. So this is what it means, is that if we cross the data, the CSF and the olfactory mucosa, we reach 100% specificity and sensitivity. So based on this finding, we uh, made an algorithm eh, where to have the diagnosis. So we do, when there is a suspicion of CJD, we do the IQ that improves condition of testing CSF using RT-Quick. If it is positive, we have the diagnosis, while if it is negative, we go on with the olfactory mucosa. So we don't do olfactory mucosa to all patients. So uh, if it is negative, of course, we have to reconsider the diagnosis. So these are the new diagnostic criteria from January 2017. And you see here that improbable CAG, a progressive neurological syndrome with a positive articuic in the CSF or in the tissue is, uh, 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 has been added. However, you see, we added even this part of the algorithm because if it is negative at RT-Quick and the patient is heterozygous at condom 129, so it means that it might be still a variant CJD, we have to consider this diagnosis and we have to do PMCA because in that patient, the RT-Quick using the conventional condition was negative. So this is all the application of the nasal brushing, no training required. Uh, is positive in the genetic form, is high diagnostic sensitivity and specificity, no complication linked to the procedure, positive in early for cause of the disease, and the seeding activity, it is log higher compared to the CSF. The problem is, can we apply this kind of test in the preclinical diagnosis? This is two cases of uh, sporadic CJD, one by Vincenzo Silani. You see, they saw this patient with an headache, <laughs> and they have a positivity at MRI, and after more than one year, he developed a CJD. Uh, we describe another case with a patient with a tumor of, uh, of, with a paraganglioma, so he underwent to every 12 months to an MRI. You see that before 13 months before the clinical onset, she had the positivity, two months before the clinical onset, uh, she had a higher positivity, and this after the clinical onset. This is a patient described by Anna Chiara. So the point is that in the genetic prion disease, you have a very long preclinical stage and a very short uh, clinical overt. And we know that we have uh, 50 mutations with different penetrance and with a variable age of onset. So in the FFI has been done a PAT in a patient 13 months before the clinical onset. And you see here, they observe uh, a reduction in the PAT in the thalamus and this seven months before the clinical onset. I mean, there is the possibility to see the uh, brain involvement early in the disease phase. So the point is that it might be here a window for a potential therapy. And uh, Fabrizio Tagliavini with this group, they did this kind of study in FFI. FFI is a mutation we has a 94% of, pe of penetrance <laughs> And they study 25 subjects, 15 carriers of mutation, and they give doxycycline 100 milligram per day. And uh, uh, the age of the patient were between 42 and 52. So the point is that they will study these patients for 10 years uh, and to see whether they might see a delay on the disease onset or absolutely uh, an absence. Uh, we, we show that uh, uh, rt quick and PMCA is positive in the olfactory mucosa in patients with FFI. And then here, we, I show you how the olfactory mucosa is, uh, has higher seeding activity compared to the CSF. So it is the appropriate candidate to do a preclinical study. And you see, we improve the condition in olfactory mucosa and by changing the substrate and the temperature, you see here, after five hours, we have a positivity in our sample while we don't have uh, any false positive. So, in conclusion, RT-Quick is uh, uh, positive in uh, OM sample, might be is the evidence of prion replication. And this is the rationale that uh, they use, Tagliavini used in their study for the FFI. is applicable to all form the genetic form, and uh, 
In particular, it is appropriate to use in those mutations which does not have 100% penetrance. And uh, with this, this study in E200K, and the family of T200K is from Calabria, and in this patient, uh, we uh, are doing the olfactory uh, mucosa sampling in, in a preclinical stage. So we collect 72 subjects, uh, 21 were carrier of E200K mutation, and this is the study. We are eight month studies, we have these subjects, and we are testing the analysis using the improved condition that I showed you previously. So uh, this is my group in Verona, Salvatore Monaco is my director, Ferrari and uh, Matilde Bongiani, they did most of the experiment of the Artiquic. Our collaboration in Montana with uh, Byron Cowie, Cristino Rue, Groovman. This is uh, Luca Sacchetti, who is the author of that you see in the movie, and the group by Maurizio Pocari in Rome. Thank you very much for your attention.